All right, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Stan Voiger. I'm a senior fellow here at AI. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Leah uh, Bustan to AI for a conversation about her new book, joined with Ran Abramitsky, Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success. Uh, make sure to buy a copy. Uh, you can buy them you know, online um, or in a bookstore. Uh, I'm delighted we're doing this event in person, um, but a warm welcome as well to our online and television uh, viewership. Uh, for our uh, viewers who are not in the room, please submit your questions to john.kearns at AI.org or via Twitter with hashtag AskAIEcon. Um, Leanne Rand's excellent, a very readable book is about the history of migration to the United States, in particular since the late 19th century. It relies on large amounts of original research involving new large data sets on millions of American immigrants. It revises our understanding of historical waves of immigration it draws important parallels between those earlier experiences and the contemporary immigrant experience. The book also summarizes our current understanding of various economic and, and cultural aspects of migration to the United States. It should serve as an important reminder uh, to many U.S. policymakers and, and voters uh, that some of the assumptions about immigration they've worked from in recent years are simply quite incorrect. This is of particular importance given the scope and scale of uh, of bad decision making we've seen in this area in recent years. Those decisions include most, most visibly perhaps the imposition of the Muslim ban and family separation during the Trump administration, but they extend as well to decades of not passing legislation, legalizing the dreamers and their families, and to the current administration's inability to get the immigration bureaucracy to operate according to anything, anything resembling reasonable standards. Um, now, the proceedings will unfold as follows today. First, Leah will present the book. Uh, she's professor of economics at Princeton University, which also serves as the director of the industrial relations section. Her previous book, Competition in the Promised Land, Black Migrants in Northern Cities and Labor Markets, examined the effect of the great black migration from the rural south during and after World War II. She's co-director of the Development of the American Econo Economy Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research and serves as co-editor uh, at the American Economic Journal of Applied Economics. Uh, after that, we'll hear from our uh, three discussants, to whom I'm sure Leah will want to respond. We'll first hear from Michael Clements, who is Director of Migration, Displacement, and Humanitarian Policy, as well as a Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. In a display of technological might, Michael will be joining us live from Turkey uh, through that computer screen. Hopefully, that'll all work out well uh, on the technological front. Um, uh, then uh, Michael will be followed by another expert in the economics of migration, uh, Ana Maria Maida. Ana Maria is professor of economics at School of Foreign Service in the Department of Economics uh, at Georgetown University. And then we'll also hear from my AI colleague, James Bethacoukas, who would like for me to tell you to subscribe to his Substack faster, please. Um, uh, after that, we'll all chat a bit more amongst ourselves, you know, we'll respond to each other. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience or so start thinking about questions. And then we, planned on, uh, we plan on ending the conversation uh, around uh, 1.30, if not a little uh, earlier. With that, Leah, welcome. Please take it away, um, and please take my place here. Thank you so much, Stan, for organizing this panel. And thanks to the AEI more broadly for being strong supporter of this research along the way and to Michael, who is beaming in from Turkey, and to the rest of you who are here today. Well, let me start with why we wrote this book. We thought immigration is a defining element of American society and the American economy. But our national conversation about immigration has been driven largely by myths, rather than by facts and by data. And what we aimed to do is to rebuild our understanding of immigration to the US from the ground up uncovering patterns that emerge from data on millions of immigrants' lives, both in the past and today. We believe that this evidence is sorely needed in our current political environment, where there's a partisan divide on immigration that is wider now than ever before. And so immigration policy has really been stuck in a holding pattern. We primarily have executive orders with Democratic presidents passing new rules to protect one group and Republican presidents passing different rules to clamp down on a different group. But all of the harder questions have been left aside. Should we expand the slots for legal immigration? What should we do about the 11 million undocumented immigrants? 
it seems like the prospect for bipartisan reform is dim. And that is the political reality in, that encouraged us to turn to the data and to the facts. To see, can we change the national conversation if we focus on the evidence? So what did we do then in our research? We started by digging through websites like Ancestry.com that allow the public to search for their relatives. I don't know if anyone here in the room has an Ancestry account. And so think of us like curious grandchildren going to look for our own grandfathers, but doing this millions of times over. And then we automated searches to allow us to follow millions of immigrant families through their time in the United States, from when they first arrive to 10, 20, 30 years later, and then to follow their children as their children enter the labor market. And all told, we're able to compile what's really the first big data on immigrant pathways in US history. Our data includes everyone. It includes bankers. It includes errand boys. It's like searching the phone book <clears throat> to include the whole population rather than focusing on the CEOs or the criminals who might make it to the front page. And the data gives us clues about how immigrants live their lives. When did they leave school? Where did they live? Who did they marry? Who are their neighbors? What did they name their children? What was their occupation and their earnings? And then where did their children move and how well did their children fare when they grew up? So with this new data, we can reassess some of the common myths that we hold about immigration and contribute a new understanding. I want to just outline four of these myths to, for you today, and there are more in the book. They probably sound familiar to you, and some of them are right and some of them are very wrong. The first myth is that we are in the midst of an unprecedented flood of immigration. Maybe today some of you saw coming through your social media feed news of a caravan that's forming on the southern border. So it, this kind of um, flood that I have in mind. At last count, there were 45 million people in the United States who were born in another country. And that's a lot. So many Americans believe that immigrants make up a larger share of the country than ever before. But that's wrong. Immigrants are 14% of the country now, and they were 14% of the country for 50 years during the Ellis Island generation. Of course, the context of immigration is very different now and then. In the past, immigrants overwhelmingly hailed from Europe, whereas now they come from all over the world. What's more, there were a few restrictions on entry in the past, as long as you were of European origin. And so most immigrants lived at the time in the United States legally. Whereas today, demand for immigration outstrips the supply of visas, and so one in four immigrants are living in the country without papers. So these are dramatic changes in the immigration policy, and I think that may have contributed to the myth that immigrants in the past integrated more quickly. So let me turn to that now. That's the second myth, the idea that the Ellis Island generation rose quickly and that immigrants today are not as successful. I think that this myth is born of nostalgia, the idea that a century ago you could arrive penniless and within a few years, you could quickly ascend from rags to riches. This myth is wrong in two different ways. First of all, many European immigrants did not come in rags. A good number of them arrived with job skills and with resources already in hand. Think about immigrants coming from Germany, from England, from Scotland, from countries that were already ahead of the US in economic development at the time. Secondly, those immigrants who did start out with low-paying jobs were not able to catch up very quickly. Most of them continued to lag behind US-born workers even at the end of their working lives. In fact, the story of immigrant progress today is remarkably similar. Just as in the past, immigrants often double their income or more by moving to the US from their home country. But once <coughs> here, in the first generation, newcomers do move up the ranks slowly but at the same pace as immigrants did in the Ellis Island generation. So this brings us to our third myth then, that immigrant families and their children will get stuck today in a permanent underclass. And the idea is 
that sure, immigrants might be moving up at the same pace today, but immigrants are coming from very poor countries nowadays. And maybe it will take many generations for those families to succeed. But what we find, and this is really the piece of the data that shocked us the most, is that background is still not destiny in the US. The dream that propels immigrants to come to America is the possibility of offering a better future for their children. And indeed, we find that today, the children of immigrants are able to surpass their parents and move up the economic ladder at the same pace as in the past. Children of immigrants that grow up close to the bottom of the income distribution, so think about the 25th percentile, for example, are more likely to reach the middle class than children of similar US-born households. And this pattern holds just as much today as in the past and from nearly every sending country. So think about it. Children of immigrants from Mexico and from the Dominican Republic are just as likely to move up from their parents' circumstances as children of poor Swedes or Finns 100 years ago. Not only does this upward mobility define the horizons of people's lives, but it also has implications for the economy as a whole. Some voters worry that immigrants will drain public resources. But this concern does not take into account the success of the second generation. A 2016 National Academy of Sciences report, which was 500 or 600 pages, so maybe very few people actually read it, makes exactly this point, that first-generation immigrants do use public resources, particularly in the cost of educating their children. But the report concludes, and I quote, that as adults, the children of immigrants, the second generation, are among the strongest economic and fiscal contributors in the US population, contributing more in taxes than either their parents or the rest of the native born population. So let me turn to the fourth myth then, which is that all of this resounding success that I've been talking about would come at the expense of the US born. Certainly, supporters of border restriction argue that immigrants will steal jobs and reduce the wages of US-born workers. And this argument is very easy to understand, and it sounds reasonable. If there were a fixed number of jobs, then the more immigrants that come in and who are holding jobs, the fewer jobs would be available for the US-born. But the number of jobs is not fixed. Our economy is not zero sum. By contributing to innovation and starting new businesses, immigrants often create employment opportunities for others. Furthermore, immigrants are not only workers, they are also consumers. So when they arrive, they need housing. Someone has to build the house. They need their kids to be in school. Someone has to become a teacher to educate their kids. As consumers, immigrants help put Americans to work. Of course, there are some winners and some losers from immigration. Some workers who do the same jobs as recent arrivals will stand to lose from immigration. And who are these people? Most of them are recent immigrants themselves. Immigrants tend to concentrate in tasks that don't require English language skills, like landscaping or construction, while the US born are more likely to hold jobs that require interacting with the public. What's more, immigrants often fill positions that US-born workers would not take at wages that consumers would be willing to pay, such as picking crops or taking care of the elderly. And in this way, immigrants create markets for certain products that otherwise simply would not exist. So how do we know all of this, all these statements that I'm making with confidence about immigration and the workforce? Economists have studied this topic for years. And in order to learn about these effects, ideally, you compare two parallel Americas one with a high level of immigration and one with a low level of immigration. But of course, it goes without saying that we cannot rerun history twice. But here is where the past can be very useful. And, uh, and Ron and I, as economic historians, have contributed to this. At a few key moments in US history, we conducted very similar experiments through the normal political process. And so we can go back and see what happened to US workers when the border closed in the 1920s. What happened when it reopened in 1965? And so through these episodes throughout US history, we can learn about the effects of immigration on US-born workers. <laughs> 
So where can we go from here? What do these findings mean about the concrete policy proposals that are on the table? The findings being that immigrants today are moving up quickly, just like the Ellis Island generation, but upward mobility takes more than one generation. The idea that the children of immigrants achieve success and not at the expense of the US born. What can we do with this? Well, one thing is clear to us. Our immigration system does not need to pre-select immigrants based on their wealth or their level of education. We do not need to move to a Canadian style point system. Rather, if we're willing to plan with the future in mind and take the long view, we can continue to accept immigrants from poor countries who can do many of the jobs that we need in agriculture and in services with the confidence that the American economy will allow their children to rise. This happened before, and we are seeing it in the data happening now. Is it possible in our current polarized political environment to make the changes that we need to the immigration system? It may seem wildly optimistic to imagine that today's splintered politics can create anything that looks like consensus, but we are heartened by the fact that when we released earlier versions of these studies that are now compiled and told and knitted together in the book, our message reached a wider spectrum of Americans than I ever believed would be possible. Here, we, here I am at AEI, um, and I heard from many conservatives saying, America works. Anyone can make it here. That's the message of your research. But I also heard from many progressives um, who saw in our research a hopeful message that a diverse set of immigrant groups can contribute to our society. So from the response that I'm getting, I get a feeling that there is a will there. What does the data say, though? Despite the loud and increasingly emboldened anti-immigrant voices these days, we can see in the data that Americans are more pro-immigration than ever, even if sentiment is split by party. The most recent Gallup polls suggest that 75% of Americans say that immigration is good for the country. And work that we did analyzing the congressional record allows us to go back to, the, to 1880 and all the way forward to today. And we've classified speeches about immigration as pro, neutral, or anti. And speeches about immigration today are more positive than ever before in the halls of Congress. So a brave politician, a real leader can make a difference here. And we take heart that there are cases in US history where this has happened, and politicians have shifted the conversation on immigration. In fact, such a shift took place in a single generation right after World War II, with efforts by President Truman and then Presidents Kennedy and Johnson to redefine America as a nation of immigrants. I take that sentiment for granted, that phrase, a nation of immigrants, it was an idea that was fostered here in Washington and then spread to the public and led to the border being reopened in 1965. So we believe that a politician who takes this message seriously will succeed. A politician who's strong in emphasizing America as a nation of immigrants rather than defensive about a supposed perpetual crisis at the border. And here's the message that immigrants contribute to our economy through science, innovation, and vital services, that the children of immigrants from nearly every poor country can move up to the middle class, that immigrants are just as keen to become Americans now as they were in the past, and that America is a country that embraces diversity and lets in new ideas. A positive and optimistic message about immigration is broadly popular and might even be a political winner if it is embraced proudly. We believe that we can reclaim the legacy of America's streets of gold. All right, can everyone hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, so now we're going to do an experiment where I will ask Michael, uh, who is behind that video screen, there he is, um, 
to wait for it. Welcome, Michael, to wait for a few seconds. Jim, Hello. you can have your, uh, your seat if you'd like. Uh, and Maria, Leah, sorry, it's a complicated setup here with all the chairs and the video screen. Uh, so, um, Michael, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. I uh, was hoping you could uh, share your thoughts on the book and the topic. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. It's incredibly generous of all of you to allow me to do this from Turkey. Uh, th there's, a, th there's something about being in Izmir, which has been on the 50-yard line of a lot of, uh, of, uh, of immigration crises recently, that's somehow vaguely appropriate. But uh, basically, it's just your generosity, and I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I just want to say a few words in a few minutes. Uh, so th this book is, is the standard reference now. Uh, basically, it should take its place along... Uh, alongside A Nation by Design by Aristide uh, uh, Zolberg or Impossible Subjects by May and Guy. Uh, in that, it should be on every college reading list about U.S. immigration. It should be on the, on the U.S. immigration uh, bookshelf of every thoughtful uh, citizen. Um, basically, Le Leah and Ron are the best there is on this, so don't look any further than this book. Just, uh, just read it. Uh, it's a perfect public affairs book. Uh, it's a uh, it's comprehensible to anyone, and it's entertaining to anyone. It's a page turner, I'd even say. Uh, it's kind of like a Tesla in that regard. You know, any teenager can drive a Tesla, but also like a Tesla, it has the latest research and technology under the hood, making it great but invisible to everybody except uh, except the experts. To to someone like me who eats the literature for breakfast every morning, it's it's all in in there, and the and the right things are in there. So, what does this book do? Fundamentally, as Leah just said, the, the framing is, uh, is myths, myths versus truths. You've heard the myths, now we're going to come, uh, like Leah just said, like curious grandchildren searching their, their family online and uh, dispel your myths with better data. And the, the myths are, are uh, well, the three that, uh, that, uh, that I'll focus on, uh, Leah mentioned four, but the three I'll focus on are about mobility, assimilation, and competition. Basically, there is a, there is a long-term view uh, in uh, in uh, in informed circles that uh, about each of these that immigration used to be good back when there was land aplenty and it was more ethnically homogeneous and my great grandparents did it the right way legally and many other things that are commonly said uh, and and that there there's something uh, in the long term perspective there's something desperately wrong with recent uh, immigration uh, that a hundred years ago there was more mobility there was more assimilation and there was less uh, competition with natives. So the core message of this book is, no, we're offering you a different long-term view, that when you take a, a careful look at the facts with the latest data, as Leah mentioned, the first big data set on immigration in the US uh, ever, uh, uh, th those facts look very different. And th the core message of the book is, quote, the immigrants today are the Americans of tomorrow. So immigration is good for America. So, uh, so, so praise is incredibly easy to do with a fantastic uh, book like this. These facts are correct. They're fresh. They're highly relevant. They're from the best people using the best data. The writing is, is highly accessible but rigorous. Uh, it's a very sophisticated presentation. So I was really struck by how when it came time to discuss why uh, specific uh, immigrant groups uh, among w within this general conclusion that that I immigrants today, for example, are assimilating and highly mobile, uh, there there is quite a lot of heterogeneity. With, for example, West Indians doing relatively better, Chinese doing relatively better. And when it came time to discuss uh, why that might be, uh, they didn't speculate themselves as as two uh, two ivory towerists. They they brought immigrant voices directly into the book. They did their own survey to gather stories and let some West Indians and Chinese tell you why they think that's true, which I thought was a very uh, substantively and uh, and for for communication reasons a very uh, excellent uh, strategy. So it, it it the the book is not specific about policy. It has it has a, a couple of policy concepts. Uh, don't force assimilation. Don't try to micromanage too much selection of immigrants on education. Uh, but the the real policy message, uh, I I would distill distill it as a policy message to politicians and to the voters that could make a coalition with them. And it's that. Uh, you've seen people making a, a, a little career on negative attacks against immigrants, but uh, you can also make a career on, on positive messages. And they even refer to a, quote, silent majority, unquote, in the U.S. willing to support such politicians. So uh, the best thing about the book that I really want to highlight uh, is something that they don't make explicit. They, they take this very humble stance that 
you know, weird like grandchildren searching their grandparents and, oh, isn't it cool? We were on this rap show. Uh, that was our 15 minutes of fame. Uh, but in fact, you get something from this book that that you, uh, because Leah and Ron are economists, that, that you wouldn't get from very sophisticated, very smart, very highly informed people studying the subject from a, from a historical, from a sociological, from other perspectives. Uh, and uh, and it's that th this this book is doing much more than just documenting uh, facts for you to face facts that they dug up with uh, with sophisticated technical work. Um, it's really one of them that I, I think is is a real contribution uh, uh, that you that you get from economists on this is that again and again uh, some of the unexpected things they find arise from the basic fact that people are, are strategic and when they exchange and invest they respond to what others do in other words uh, in a in a simple world of all else equal there's a downward sloping demand curve for labor when there's more labor uh, the price is going to go down uh, what they emphasize again and again is that it in a in a market where everybody is responding strategically to everybody else because of incentives, uh, that's not true. That that model of all else equal is useful for understanding, for example, why gas prices are higher now than three months ago. They are are not uh, useful for and were never intended for. And Alfred Marshall uh, explicitly said they they weren't useful for uh, understanding the the long term development of market processes. So why do sons and parents, sons of parents from Central America, move up faster than natives? Uh, because those parents uh, tend to uh, to to choose to live based on potential mobility for their children to a degree much more than than natives do. That is, they respond to that particular incentive more. Why do refugees integrate so quickly? Uh, for example, learning uh, learning English uh, typically faster than non-refugee immigrants because of incentives, because they're more likely to settle permanently. Uh, they they have less to 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 go home to, and have a stronger incentive to invest in integration. Why didn't the wages of workers in Cleveland go up when Cleveland's supply of Southern and Eastern European workers was drastically restricted in 1921 and 24? But Cincinnati's supply of German and Irish was much less restricted because of incentives, because firms had a strong incentive to do other stuff than bid up wages. They had incentives to switch to other labor supplies, to mechanize, to produce less labor intensive products and many other things that they in fact uh, uh, did instead of bidding up wages. Uh, why is the rate of criminal activity among unauthorized immigrants so low? Because of the potential double penalty of jail and potential deportation that other people making those trade-offs uh, don't face. And they really, uh, they really go deep on perverse consequences of policy, which is something where economists also have a lot to say, a lot of value to add to these kind of discussions. Um, they, they talk about how trying to force integration of Germans in, for example, Ohio by banning German in primary schools actually caused them to integrate less linguistically. And this was one of the, the delights of this book that, that I had that, that uh, those of you who are Americans might have, which is that you, you might learn something directly about your own family from this. My grandfather was a primary school student in Dayton, Ohio, who was subject to those laws. And I've noted for a long time that my, my German-speaking family uh, uh, didn't integrate over four generations. And uh, through my grandfather still had uh, German language birth certificates, German language church, and many other things. And that now I, I, I understand that that was, not just, uh, that was not just a natural process that was actually uh, encouraged by policy. Um, so, uh, so... So before shutting up, I, I just want to mention uh, three, uh, uh, I'll, I'll call them mild critiques that I had, and all of these were, are, are completely understandable. They're just trade-offs that, uh, that these authors made about a difficult subject that, that one could question, but, uh, but are, are very uh, legitimate choices. So one of them is that they take the very reasonable strategy of just sidestepping some research debates and, and approaching the, the public and politicians directly and saying, look, you're interested in this subject. Here is the evidence that we found on that subject. They don't get bogged down uh, fighting about uh, debates in the literature. And like Paul Graham said about startups in Silicon Valley, not winning by competing, but by transcending. Uh, I think that's a very effective strategy for a large potential audience out there. It, it, is, uh, it has a drawback, which is that 
when people hear about other kinds of research, they might think, well, you know, that's not really addressed in this book. It's kind of he said, she said, I don't really know. And uh, one example of that is that there is a, uh, the, the book doesn't talk too much about, uh, about uh, wage assimilation uh, recently. It talks about cultural assimilation, but less about wage assimilation. And there's quite a lot of, of research suggesting that, uh, that wage assimilation from between immigrants and natives has been slowing down in recent decades. You know, my strategy and something like that would be to say, uh, that is a is is a that is an ill posed question. Given that, as Leah mentioned, a quarter of the immigrant population is legally banned from even trying to acquire citizenship, which is is a sine qua non of full integration. Uh, it should not surprise anybody looking in census data that includes both authorized and and, and authorized immigrants that uh, that people banned from integrating are not able to integrate. There's some circular causation going on there. But uh, as I said, uh, uh, th there is a drawback to taking pages upon pages to, to counter other uh, uh, arguments and other data. And, and there's, uh, there are real advantages to just making your case directly. Uh, a, a second uh, mild drawback is that really you know, myth busting is, uh, is, is, is very effective because it starts where people are. They've heard the myths. They believe a lot of them. But it also lets the myths set the agenda, and that can uh, that can lead to some strange discussions. Uh, one example of that was in the in the section of the book on on competition. They talk about how, uh, and which is the case that in in many cases uh, immigrants and and natives are not competing with each other but complementing each other in in the labor market. Then they say, you know, there are a few cases in which there could be zero sum. Uh, for example, there's some work suggesting that Soviet mathematicians crowded U.S. mathematicians out of the market. You know, uh, labor economists have, have uh, defined the research agenda of this field in a very narrow way for a long time, and that's a very obvious case where I'd say, look, uh, as the son of a, of, a, of a mathematics professor, I can say definitively that the, the, the academic mathematics does not exist to create jobs for U.S. mathematicians. It exists in order to to find truth and, and beauty. And if Russian mathematicians are better at it, then no Americans should be doing it. Uh, and and uh, I thought that that reflected that that particular paragraph reflected a, a, a an, an allowing labor economists to to set a very narrow agenda about the the relevant research questions that that was a little uncomfortable. And the the third and last one I want to mention is that. Uh, Really, the, this book chooses to, and again, this is a this is a very legitimate and understandable decision. This this book just chooses to sidestep uh, questions of race mostly, and to, to me, it, it, it's it sat a, a little uncomfortable in that it uh, telling the story of of of, of immigration policy in the U.S. Uh, without highlighting the role of race is a little bit like Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. Um, but you know the, the the book's conclusion that the immigrants of today are the Americans of tomorrow uh, is is not uh, seen as a feature but as a bug by by some uh, by some people in America now as a century ago. So you know when talking about uh, Asian exclusion, the 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 book says the country chose its fork in the road. The door swung shut to Asian immigration for nearly a century, in a purely descriptive sense. Uh, no, not not a normative word about whether that was good or bad. Uh, the 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 chapter that's the brief history of U.S. immigration policy uh, doesn't really talk about uh, uh, the role of race at all. It doesn't mention that the 1924 immigration closure was not just a full Asian exclusion; it was also total African exclusion. In that the the quotas for immigration from that time to 1965 were based on uh, 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 the the representation of, of of people ethnically in the population decades earlier, and uh, People of African origin were explicitly and very deliberately left out of that uh, of that calculation entirely. Um, when when the book talks about the 45th president of the United States sitting in the White House and and questioning why we should welcome anybody from quote from countries like Haiti and Nigeria unquote, there's no uh, the, any discussion of what Haiti and Nigeria might have in common is is left implicit. And I I, I really do understand that uh, this choice. Uh, the, the goal of this book is to reach a, a very wide uh, uh, audience. Uh, it is doing that. It should do that. And, uh, and, uh, and, and proceeding down the road of 
uh, uh, talking about some of the origins of these policies and some of the origins of the, of the these notions is likely to derail that enterprise. Uh, but it, it also has a drawback, which is that people who uh, are not of European origin might, uh, at, on, at some moments of the book and in some pages, uh, experience a little pause of, of, of not recognizing themselves in the pages. Um, all of which is 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 just uh, to say that uh, uh, th these these choices are are choices that that must be made by by any expert when distilling a, a billion uh, facts into into three or four lessons. They're choices that are made el well and expertly, and uh, uh, nothing is going to supersede this book for a very long time. So please uh, please uh, uh, please read it and and learn from it as I did. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Before we go to, to Ana Maria, uh, Leah, do you want to respond to his comments? Michael, thank you so much for joining us uh, from Turkey. I mean, it's really meaningful to me that you took the time to do that and you read and distilled the book so beautifully. Um, I, I, do, uh, I do want to mention that um, in terms of the recent evidence on wage assimilation, um, the jury is very much out. Michael is pointing to the fact that there was a paper by Borjas a few years ago suggesting that wage assimilation has been slowing down. Since then, there's been a few studies looking into the administrative records where you can actually follow people over time rather than cohorts. And they are putting a question mark on that finding. Um, so we do have it buried in a footnote. I agree, we're really trying to keep things um, moving along in the body of the book, but we do have a footnote about this sort of back and forth in the literature, and hopefully within a few years, that question will be settled. Um, on the question of race, it, um, definitely when we talk about the history of U.S. immigration policy, um, we don't spend much time on the eugenics movement um, and some of the genesis of the exclusions, both for Africans, Asians, and also Southern and Eastern Europeans. It's touched on, but it's not the emphasis. Um, there is a discussion on race when it comes to current immigration um, and the uh, success of the second generation. It's a really interesting pattern where um, there's one group uh, of children of immigrants who are not moving up as quickly as the US born, and, that are, and those are sons, so particularly boys, of Caribbean parents. So Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, and Jamaica. But it's not a simple race story, because the daughters of those same families are doing incredibly well. And sons of families from the Dominican Republic, many of whom are black, and from Nigeria, again, majority black country, are doing well. So there's a complicated interaction between race and gender. It seems to be particularly also a Caribbean story. So it's not just race, but it's also region. And we, we have some thoughts about this in the book, but um, that the, the mechanisms and the underlying causes are far from settled. Uh, but we do um, think that race probably uh, plays a role in that pattern um, and potentially um, racialized policing. Because in our data, if you are in prison, you receive a zero in income. So you're in the data set, but you have a zero income. And it was not possible for us to strip those people out because this data comes from underlying tax records from the Opportunity Insights Lab at Harvard. So we have it in aggregate form, and we're not able to really do the detailed work we would want to do to analyze how much of this is simply a question of racialized policing and incarceration. But if you were to take that population out, maybe the boys uh, from these Caribbean families would also be doing very well. Um, so we do try to tackle that issue. It's a tough issue. Um, but we, we stay away from um, some of the questions about American history that I think have been very fraught recently. Um, but thank you so much, Michael. Um, it just means so much to me that you uh, took the time to read so carefully and uh, to join us from um, halfway around the world. Thank you. It's my honor. Thank you. Um, I have a question that I think fits in nicely with this before we go to, to Dona Maria. The, on your, in, in the permanent underclass myth that you, you guys talk a lot about convergence and about sort of conditional uh, performance of, of second generation immigrants, right? conditional on uh, the, 
percentage, percentile income distribution. I think a lot of uh, concern about the underclass is not, it's not really about conditional convergence, right? It's about the unconditional uh, level at which immigrant groups arrive as well. Um, and not so much about, you know, seven periods from now you will have converged completely, but we're particularly concerned about the next 50 years, right? which is not a crazy perspective, I think, for these kind of public policy uh, views. And there, I do think that there are differences, right, with a century ago. Is that, is, is that a correct reading, or how, how do you see that? The major difference between past and present is the initial income level of the parents. In the past, the average immigrant actually earned no more or no less than U.S. born worker. But that's because there's some countries where the immigrants were earning a lot more, Germany, England, et cetera, and some where they were earning less. But on average, the US born and uh, immigrants were neck and neck 100 years ago. Today, immigrants are coming from much poorer countries relative to the US than they used to. So in the past, immigrants were coming from, let's say, the top 30 countries in the world. Of course, GDP per capita information 100 years ago is not great, but roughly speaking, the top 30 countries. Today, nine out of 10 of our sending countries, countries we receive, sorry, nine out of the 10 top sending countries, okay, the countries that send the most immigrants to the US, are ranked between 90th and 150th in the world out of around 200 countries. So we're pulling from very poor countries today the way we, uh, relative to how we used to. And so it's not surprising that immigrants are earning a lot less than the US born now. That's for the parents. That's when the parents first arrive. And then Stan is asking about just unconditionally, on average, given that kids are being raised in these poorer households, how are the second generation doing? And the answer is that for many countries, actually the children achieve parity with the US born without controlling for the family background that they come from, without controlling for the fact that the parents are earning 50 log points less the children are catching up from do you want many. Trans, do you want to translate 50 log points for the, uh, for the people out there? <laughs> Roughly think about it as, a, as 50% less, but it could be it's, it's, it's larger than 50% less. You know? So um, it's substantially less. So we're talking about someone, a household that's making 20, 25,000 versus a household that's making 60, 70,000. 70, um, and yet the kids are catching up from many sending countries. There are a few countries where that's not true. It's not true from Haiti and Jamaica, as we already talked about, even, even conditionally. It's not true for Mexico. And Mexico is a large part of the story. However, it's not the case that the kids are at the same point of lagging behind. They've made up a lot of ground. It's just that they haven't completely caught up to parity. So when we're talking about these unconditional comparisons, it's really, it's a hard comparison to make because we're asking a kid who is being raised at a household making 25,000 to catch up to someone who, where they were being raised in a household making 60 or 70,000. That's a lot of ground to cover. And for many sending countries, the kids are doing it. Um, and so that is in a way even more spectacular. Um, but because there are a few countries where that's not true, um, I think that that raises concern. So we thought it would be useful to say, okay, let's compare apples to apples as much as possible. Let's find a household that's, where the parents are U.S. born, but they're also at the lower end of the income distribution. And there you can see that even for kids from Mexico, et cetera, um, the kids are doing better. So if you take two similar households, the kids are surpassing the children of the U.S. born. If you allow all the differences to play out, there's still many sending countries where the kids are reaching parity, which is really a tremendous achievement. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Ana Maria, shall we go to your comments? Yeah, thank you. I don't know. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this uh, amazing book. This is a great book that I um, encourage you to read. And it is a very uh, important book, both for those of you who are interested in the policy dimension of migration and for academics. And I'm an academic myself, uh, and I found this book to be a treasure trove of ideas for new papers, for research. And I'm very uh, excited to talk with Leah and Bran uh, about these ideas. Now, let me give you the broad picture about the book. What uh, Ran and Leah do is to go back uh, 
to some uh, um, beliefs about migrants now versus 100 years ago. And these beliefs have become part of the narrative about migration in the United States. So they're very important beliefs because they affect how Americans think about migration. And what they find is that these beliefs, a lot of times, are not true. They're myths. So what I really like is that they go systematically through a lot of um, um, uh, statements in the migration literature, checking in the data whether they are true or not. And I would say that nobody, no story, no uh, even uh, family stories, nobody escapes their careful eye every time they tell us about uh, somebody. They also go back to the data. They identify the individual record in the census, and they check whether the story was true. So I myself got very curious about it, and I opened an Ancestry.com account. I found myself, I'm Italian, I found myself, I didn't find as much information, I think, as um, for an American family, but um, I could find some information. It would be nice if Ancestry um, included more information for other countries. But um, so what did I like a lot about the book? What I like is that this book, um, of course, um, and this is a point uh, um, which um, is clear, we should differentiate between myth and reality. But what is more important to me is the fact that um, we should do so also for those myths that are meant for good. So there are some statements in the book that probably um, came out to create a good narrative about the immigrant experience in the United States. But the issue with doing that is that these uh, statements which are not true can backfire. And they are backfiring because these are statements that uh, then, you know, when you look at the immigrant experience now and you see that first generation migrants don't move up the economic ladder so fast, if you think that in the past the immigrants were moving up very fast, then you draw some conclusions which are wrong. So again, again and again, the importance to go back to data, more data, and more data to get at the truth. And especially for a topic like migration, which is so controversial. Now, I wanted to make some uh, more targeted remarks, uh, um, and also uh, for those of you who are more interested in the uh, research and academic aspects of uh, the book. And I'm going to divide my remarks between remarks regarding the first generation and remarks regarding the second generation. So first of all, for the first generation, and here I'm thinking about myself as well, I'm a first generation migrant, um, the way economists think about uh, assimilation is by comparing how much a first generation migrant makes at arrival compared to uh, a native worker with similar um, socioeconomic background. And that's fine, I understand why that is done. It is to keep constant the outside conditions the labor market conditions, and to focus on individual level drivers. But from the point of view of the migrant, what really matters is another gap. It's the gap between how much the migrant was making back at home and how much he can make potentially in the US as proxied by how much natives who are similar to him or her are making. So what I'm saying is that there is a much bigger gap that these first generation migrants are covering. And when they make the first move, and you mentioned that a few times, that's when they make the biggest jump. And you know, that initial big jump might be the greatest fraction of the gap. And um, so, you know, from the point of view of a first generation migrant, um, that may be a lot accomplished. And um, they may feel that they don't need to cover the final length, yeah. also because the final length may require facing trade-offs which are very tough. 
So let me give you an example. I am used to living in very dense areas. And so I wanted to live in a city. And even if you offer me a billion dollars, I wouldn't live in a small town. So there are some trade-offs that, based on preferences, first-generation migrants address in a different way from native workers, and that may imply that they don't cover the last part of this gap. Another point that I wanted to make is about how the literature, um, and uh, um, you in the book measure assimilation. Um, uh, usually, economists measure assimilation based on nominal wages. But what I'm thinking is that uh, um, really what would be also nice to do is to measure assimilation in terms of real wages. So, uh, again, let me give you an example. Um, I have a daughter, and um, in the back of my mind, if uh, things don't go as planned, I always think that she might go to university in Italy because it's much cheaper. So what does that mean? It means that as a first-generation migrant, I have access to goods and services back in Italy that second-generation migrants and Americans don't have access to because they don't speak Italian. And so what that means is that in real terms, my nominal wage is uh, higher than for second-generation migrants and natives. And uh, so even if we see that the nominal wages of first-generation migrants uh, are not as high as um, um, Americans with similar skills, it might be that in real terms, uh, we are not that far. Um, next, I'm going to focus uh, on the second generation. And here, I think the book really does a wonderful job of um, uh, making us understand how important the second, the second generation is in uh, thinking about migration in the United States. It is the generation where success of immigrants takes place in the United States. And it is, therefore, the generation that defines how Americans think about migration. And this is very important because I will tell you, in other countries, like European countries, uh, things are quite different. And Lee and Rand mentioned that. So there are studies for um, Germany, France, uh, the UK, which show that second generation migrants don't move up the economic ladder as fast as second generation migrants in the United States. And that, in turn, has a big impact on how people view migration in Europe compared to the United States. They view it in a more negative way. And they're not thinking about first generation ones, they're thinking really about second generation migrants. That's where the difference between the United States and Europe really is big. And related to this point, I found interesting the fact that in the United States, second generation migrants move up the economic ladder faster than second generation migrants do in Europe. But for the general population, it's the opposite. Americans in general have lower social mobility than Europeans. And so I wonder whether there is a link between these two findings. And one possibility is that when we measure assimilation of migrants, we always do it relative to natives. And so to the extent that in the United States, uh, natives are moving up faster, uh, they're moving up slower than in Europe, uh, then it is easier for immigrants, second generation migrants, to catch up in the United States relative to Europe. Um, next, uh, I wanted to talk about the reasons discussed in the book for why second generation migrants uh, move up the economic ladder so fast. There are two main reasons. The first one is that their parents might have been undervalued in the labor market. So, for example, you hear I have an accent. So, first-generation migrants have an accent. 
and so that might penalize them in the labor market, especially for low-skilled workers. And so some first-generation migrants might come to the United States, and they not, may not make as much money um, uh, as uh, uh, Americans who are as skilled as them, but can speak English much better. And so they end up lower in the income distribution of the United States. And so then the second generation migrants more easily can move up the economic ladder compared to that undervalued reference point. Um, and there, what I found interesting is that, for example, you do find that Italians, uh, second generation Italians in the past, uh, moved up uh, really fast, they're at the top of the picture, and you know, Italians are not really good with languages. <laughs> they had this very big accent like me, and so there might be a reason. It would be interesting to analyze uh, the linguistic differences across origin countries to see whether there is any relationship. And um, the second reason why second generation migrants um, uh, do assimilate so fast um, is geography. So here the point is that um, first generation migrants choose locations that are good for the economic assimilation of second generation migrants. And, uh, and I believe this, and there is also supporting evidence from, for example, the paper by Koda, um, Kovac and Kadena. Uh, so migrants have much higher mobility than American workers. They react much faster to labor demand shocks. They're much better able to identify locations in the United States that do well and move there. Um, but my question is, why uh, this ability of first-generation migrants to identify good places helps their kids, but not the first-generation migrants themselves? And one possibility is that the uh, first-generation uh, migrants may themselves create the conditions uh, that uh, help uh, the economic assimilation of their kids. And here I'm thinking about your, for example, work on uh, uh, preferences for redistribution, uh, uh, the public sector, public expenditures, uh, so to the extent that in the very long run, uh, immigration increases incomes, and so through the fiscal effects, there might be a bigger uh, public expenditures by the government because revenues go up, then schools will improve, and so that may make it easier for second generation migrants, for their kids to move up the economic ladder. And finally, to conclude, um, I think, and this is, uh, again, a more um, technical point, but it is important also for its policy implications. When we think about the impact of immigration in all the literature, what we do as economists is to um, divide up the population between immigrants, who are the first generation, and everybody else. And the everybody else includes Americans, and second generation migrants. So we include uh, the second generation migrants among Americans. And so in a way we are potentially finding estimates which are biased. Be what we should be doing, and I'm convinced of that more and more, is that we should consider three separate categories. Uh, we should compare first to second to natives. Uh, also because it might be that what we are picking up when we look at the impact of first-generation migrants is the impact of second-generation ones. Um, and um, so uh, I have found that uh, in, in a recent paper of mine, which is related to the National Academy of Science report that you mentioned. So in this paper with a couple of co-authors, Mine Senses and Walter Steingras, we find that from a fiscal point of view, second-generation migrants have a much more positive impact than first generation ones on provision of public goods and services at the local level in the United States, at the county level. So it does make a difference to break up the population across immigrant generations versus natives. Thank you very much. I encourage everybody to read the book. And as an academic, especially students, especially scholars, but also everybody who's interested in the policy dimension of migration. Yeah, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Do you want to uh, respond to Sure. Um, thank you so much. There was so much in what you said. Let me just address a few of your points. Um, uh, so 
The first thing you said is that um, the largest gap that immigrants cross is actually from leaving the home country and moving to the U.S. That's where their incomes doubled in the past and actually more than doubled today. Um, and this is something that, as an economist, saddens me, that there's no government that cares about this game. The home country, of, the immigrants' home country don't care. They think maybe we're losing uh, a workforce or there's brain drain, but they don't care about the immigrants themselves gaining. And actually, as Americans, we don't really care about that either. Um, so the voters here care about the questions about convergence more so than the gains to the migrants themselves. So in, as an economist and as someone who cares about the welfare of individuals, I care about that deeply. But the, b with a book that's intending to speak to the national conversation about immigration policy, we touch on this and allude to it, but really make a choice not to emphasize it too broadly. Um, the second thing I want to mention is uh, the, the point about Europe versus the US. Actually, if I had one thing that I could go back and do more of in Streets of Gold, I, want, I would do more to compare to the European case. Because it is fascinating how in the latest evidence, and the jury is still out, I think there's recent work on this topic in a variety of European countries, but as Anne Maria said, in England and in Germany and in France, second generation immigrants are not moving up as quickly as in the United States. And what, from what we see provisionally, as in Canada or in or Australia, so there is a difference between these settler economies that have a long history of being immigrant receiving areas, and European countries that, for a century, were immigrant sending countries. Only recently have they been immigrant receiving countries. And some people say it's just selection. Well, the immigrants coming to Europe are from Africa and from the Middle East, and we're getting a different selection of immigrants. And I think that's probably not the, the story, because we see really across the board from some very poor countries that second generation immigrants are doing well in the US. So I think that there's something special about the United States that has been successful at assimilating, integrating immigrants for over a century. And we don't want to lose that. That's something that's, that's been a legacy to us, and we don't want to let that go. And we can see Europe as a counterpoint. So I would like to learn more about what exactly goes into that special sauce, but I, I, I'll, I know that it's something that's very special and we shouldn't let go. Um, and then um, some of, of your points of, uh, uh, all interrelate to the idea of location. Um, uh, even the point about nominal versus real income does relate to location as well, because a large part of what differentiates between nominal wage, like what you're taking home in your paycheck, versus real wage, which is like your, your real standard of living, um, is the cost of housing. And so it has a lot to do with location. Um, and so one thing that is true, but I think we didn't really mention enough in the book, is that location does help the first generation as well. Hmm. Remember I said that immigrants 100 years ago actually earned the same amount on average as the US born in response to Michael? That's true, but if you compare people living in the same state or people living in the same city, immigrants actually earn a lot less than the US born on average. So what does that mean? It means that one of the ways that immigrants were able to earn as much as the US born in the past is that they moved to cities. They didn't move to rural areas. They moved to the north. They did not move to the poorer US south. And they moved to states that had high incomes for everyone. So even for the first generation, location does matter. And we just really didn't emphasize that enough. So I appreciate that. Um, and then this is a bit of a research uh, point. But I do want to say thank you so much for mentioning this idea of um, thinking more carefully in economics about how we treat the second generation. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many studies with how many different outcomes have said the effect of immigrants on wages or fiscal or school performance or whatever it is. And wherever you're going to find first generation immigrants, you're going to find second genera generation immigrants too, because it's going to be the kids of those families. And maybe we do have um, some biases that are coming in there that you know I hadn't really thought about until you brought that point, and it's an important point. Excellent, thank you. Before we go to 
to Jim. I had a, a couple of questions that relate to, to some, some of the things uh, Ana Maria brought up. So uh, when you talk about the first generation of their real wages, something first generation immigrants have that, that other groups do not is the option to, to return. I know you've, you've done work on that uh, historically on Norwegian immigrants and how the least successful ones among them were more likely to return to, to Norway. Do we, do we still see that now? I think it's an important policy question too, because obviously there's always a debate over, you know, which immigrants are likely to become uh, uh, quote unquote public charges, or do we still see that negative selection in who returns, who doesn't? Do people return less um, because the because it's been so much more, it's gotten so much more difficult to, to to enter in the first place? What what's the story there? So in the overall numbers, there's always been 25 to 30 percent of immigrants who return. That was true 100 years ago, and it's true now. It may be becoming slightly less true um, with the border tightening up. You're right. Uh, but in the most recent numbers, that's what um, people... Well, you weren't allowed to fly anywhere for like two years. So. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, in the very, very recent term, yes. Um, maybe even just in the past 10 years, it's, be, it's fallen a bit. But in broad brush, it's always been around a quarter of immigrants who go home. Um, and... Again, this is a group that's just sort of lost from our public discussion because as American policymakers, we don't really care about the return migrants. Um, and it turns out that, uh, St like St Stan is saying, 100 years ago, it was immigrants who were not doing very well who returned. But that doesn't mean that they were, didn't have the potential to do well. It turns out that these were immigrants who came to the US with a purpose in mind. They wanted to work as quickly as they could, not necessarily invest and learn English, but work, save up money, and go home. And when these immigrants went home, they actually did remarkably well. So they came from the poorest of the poor. They, they did not earn a lot compared to the US poor and when they were here in the US. But when they went home, they were more likely to own land than other people who had never come to the US. They were more likely to be successful. And so they used the US as a strategy to do well in life. And that's actually a group that, again, as an economist, as someone who cares about individuals, that's a value that the United States then shares with the rest of the world. And there's actually, particularly in Scandinavia in, and in um, the Baltic states, a number of heads of state who had spent time in the US and then eventually like, moved up and became presidents or heads of parliament, and they shared some of these democratic ideas that they learned about in the US. And at the time, there was not even a universal franchise. And they were able to spread ideas of democracy back home as well. Um, and we've just, we lose that component of some of the value of immigration because that's not relevant to us as American policymakers. Uh, but spending time in the US in a short term and then going home can be another way that people can make a life. And that's, that's an important, and we miss that, out on that when we think only about people who stay here. And then the second point to, about location choice, I know there's, so there, there's a discussion in the book about labor market competition. How, how do you think of housing market competition? Because obviously there, much more so than 100 years ago, right, housing supply has gotten way less elastic, and so that I think is a, is a concern people, people have. How, how do you think about that? I think it's really a sad state of affairs that we have to talk about housing competition in that way. Um, there's no reason why we can't have more construction and more building and build the housing that we need for immigrants in some of these really productive cities where immigrants want to be and where many American workers want to be. So it's artificial scarcity, and that's a whole other issue that we could get into on a whole other panel. Um, but uh, unfortunately, like, whenever we look at any issues in the US, it often comes back to housing. Um, and that creates a sense of competition with immigrants. I think that creates a lot of the concerns that people have. And so one way, indirect way, to possibly lessen concerns about immigration um, and lessen concerns about what is this going to do to my real wage is to uh, think about uh, more construction. Yeah. So um, now let's turn to our final panelists. Uh, he will regale us from tales of when he, as a young boy, <laughs> arrived in Lowell, Massachusetts, and spent his Saturdays at the Greek American Political Club. Okay. Jim Bathakoukas, take it away. No, that actually happened, though. I appreciate you creating that mythology around me. Um, uh, uh, love the book, and here's how much I love the book. Even though I got a wonderful free uh, copy, I went out and with my own money, I, uh, I went and bought the Kindle version so I would have access to it 
anywhere, day or night, that if I needed to access high-level immigration, economic research, it was there for me. So, I, so that is, I, I, so I also have it uh, on Kindle, which I paid for uh, myself. It's a great book. Uh, and uh, I, I think... Uh, I think in a finer world, in, a, in a, a more just, beautiful world, this book would be the end of the argument, right? I, I think it makes a powerful, compelling case on issues of whether it's fiscal burden or, uh, or mobility uh, about the benefits of immigration to the immigrants themselves, as you rightly know, and, uh, and to the United States uh, on, a, on, a, on a variety of levels. But my... My concern is that where the debate is today, while this is a necessary book, it is not a, it ultimately is not a sufficient book for the debate. And as I was, and, I was, and the, uh, a little uh, spoiler, some people don't read books when they go on these panels. I read this book, and I took actual handwritten, very detailed, uh, detailed notes um, about different things I found, found interesting. But occasionally, I, I, other things popped in my head. Uh, for instance, when uh, you're writing about the, the, the innovation effects uh, of immigrants, I, I thought about the, the famous uh, Steve Bannon quote that he was concerned there were too many Asian CEOs at tech, at tech companies. And I, was, uh, and I was reading the book, uh, I thought about, uh, especially given the, 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 the fantastic uh, economic evidence presented here, I, I, I thought about a, a debate I went to between uh, I think it was somebody from the Cato Institute and then someone from an anti-immigration group. And they were get, doing a debate. And the person from Cato, uh, though, though not presenting nearly as powerful an argument as Leah does in this book, uh, uh, still presented a pretty powerful argument, uh, charts and data uh, about, uh, about the, the benefits of immigration, trying to dispel some myths uh, that, they, that uh, they weren't moving up the ladder, that they're all going to become public charges, that kind of thing. And I'm like, wow. I'd hate to be the person arguing the other side of the case. And then the other person came up and said, if this person, I can imagine someone saying this to you in a debate, if this person had their way, look, there are, I don't know what the number is, there's a billion people who said they would love to be Americans, but if this person had their way, they would let all billion into the United States. And at that moment, 30 seconds in that person's response to the debate, he had won that debate, he had won that crowd. Because that's what they, they were fearing what that meant. That, they would, that this country would be overwhelmed by that billion, and that billion may not look like the people in that crowd, and that debate was over. And then the other thing, and this just happened, um, uh, uh, Stan, thank you for mentioning the <laughs> I Find Substack newsletter, but I recently wrote something about, uh, about Asian Americans and, how, and, you know, and the, uh, their, their impact in the United States and how well they've done and what they contribute to growth and innovation. And then I got a, uh, I got a direct message from a, uh, a conservative a journalist who, uh, see, I had it here. He said, um, your growth, so I gave a lot of you know, economic growth, because your growth arguments are mostly valid. Didn't, but ultimately, didn't care about that. What he cared about was, uh, it's, it was kind of a mishmash talking about, like, immigrants break down trust in society, and therefore we have less coherent government policies. Uh, I know there's been some research looking at diversity and, and support for the welfare state. In my heart, I don't think this person really cares about the welfare state, uh, more, more expansive welfare state, well, at least not for everybody. Uh, but he was immediately sidestepping these kinds of arguments. And I think the book is powerful enough that it's going to be very, very hard to go up there and make the economic case that immigrants are bad for Native Americans, that immigrants are bad for, for innovation, that, they're all, that, that they aren't going to move up the ladder. I think it's going to be, this book, I think, really helps making the case that those myths are untrue. But I fear in this climate that they're just going to quickly move beyond that to all this other stuff, saying, well, that may be true, but they're bad for America in, the, in these other ways. They make us less cohesive. We don't trust each other. And obviously, I think there's something else going on there that has very little to do, really, with about trust and cohesion. And I think Michael was referring to it uh, as part of his critique. So, um, so I, think, I think to make the argument, I think that the, the economic argument needs to be made. I think, and Michael and Maria, you know, summed it up far better than I could. I think absolutely fantastic. Again, my concern is it's not enough. And I'm, I, I, have, I have feeling it might be concerned also that it might not be enough. <laughs> Well, 
Let me start by um, mentioning one thing, which is that I knew I was coming to an economics-oriented crowd. So I decided to skip over chapter six. And chapter six is all about the cultural assimilation. Because it's true, when we go on airplanes and we tell people what we're working on, go to a dinner party, people say, wait, you define assimilation as catching up in terms of wages? That's not what I think of. I think of like, are these people really becoming American? You know, did they have Thanksgiving dinner? Do they dress like us? Do they sound like us? And we thought, well, let's take a look as much as we can in the data. And it's true that it's hard to find measures of this that you can compare past to present. Because that's a piece of it that we really wanted to tackle, which is the idea, and I've even heard this on Rush Limbaugh, that Italian immigrants wanted to become Americans first, that they jettisoned their old Italian identity, that they wanted their kids to learn English, and that they wanted to embrace America. And these days, immigrants today are different. So we wanted to compare to the past. And we tried to come up with as many measures as we could. Are immigrants living in immigrant neighborhoods enclaves, or are they moving out into integrated neighborhoods? Are they learning English? Do they only marry other people from their ethnic group or country of origin, or do they marry someone who's US born or someone from another country? And then the one that we think is the most fun is what are the names that immigrants choose for their kids as they spend more time in the country, which is a really interesting barometer. It's like a temperature that you can take on an immigrant a few times in their life who have two or three kids, one when you first arrive and then one a few years later, have you switched towards a more American sounding name? And what we found really surprised us, because I think of all of the myths, we really had bought into this one. We thought, OK, European immigrants in the past, they're from Europe. They're not that different. And immigrants today are from all over the world. And today, we have this more like multiculturalism vibe that you, know, you can keep your own identity. But what we found is that immigrants actually shift away from ethnic sounding names at the same pace now as they did in the past. They marry outside of the group. They move out of immigrant neighborhoods at the same pace as in the past. I think we just forget. You know, we have a lot of nostalgia about someone who's an immigrant from three or four generations ago. In my case, I think of my grandfather as an immigrant, but he's really not. He's the child of immigrants. And it was really my great grandfather who I never met and who really never learned English and who never moved up occupationally, um, and who basically didn't really work. He had his wife work as running the front of the store, and he was like studying Talmud all day. And I never met him, so I don't think, I don't know him, I don't think about him, and I think about my own grandfather, of course, who like went to American schools, went to city college, became a doctor. I'm like, okay, yeah, he assimilated, but we forget that it was slower in the past than we imagine. And so if you actually use the data, you can move beyond these anecdotes. And OK, that's not going to convince people who uh, want to find a reason to, um, to keep immigrants out. Because you can bring as many data uh, points and pieces of evidence as you want. But if someone has a very strongly held belief that immigrants are not ever going to become Americans, there's not much you can do to convince them. So I promise you, I will never go on Tucker Carlson, because I don't think that there's going to be a, you know, a, a, um, an actual debate and exchange of ideas there. But for anyone who is open-minded and willing to look at the evidence, I think there is something in the book about these cultural questions. Chapter six. Chapter six. And the other thing is um, on the one billion number. Right. You know, Matt Iglesias has a book out, and Matt and I are going to have a conversation at Princeton in September, and his book is called One Billion Americans. And there's nothing in Streets of Gold that's saying that we should go to one billion. And there's nothing in Streets of Gold that even says we should increase the number more than we have now, um, even though there is some good work by Washington think tanks saying maybe we should uh, increase our quota for legal immigration by, let's say, 100 or 150,000 extra people a year. But 100,000 people and a billion people is a couple orders of magnitude. And just because the current level of immigration that we have is good and is successful does not mean that increasing that tenfold or more is going to be good or successful. Um, it's just I think that we need to really protect against going backwards. And there had been an idea floated uh, in the Trump administration, the RAISE Act in 2017, saying we should cut the number of legal slots by 
and we should allocate them on a point basis. And that, I think, would be going backwards. And so at the moment, um, just sort of preserving what we have is um, where I think, you know, where we come down. And then marginal increases as needed because we need workers in certain sectors um, and not to be worried about letting in workers who are low skilled because we think that that's going to be a forever condition. I just have one quick question. Yeah. So if, if, if we're going to keep the, the, let's say, the current levels, and is it 14% is? 14% of our population is If let's say yeah. you know, either we think that's a good number or we just thought a given maybe a slow changing political atmosphere that we really cannot change that. I think some people might be surprised that you would say, okay, if we can only have 14%, why not select for like the smartest, most talented 14% we could get? Why still have this kind of mix? Well, I think there's a lot of jobs that um, are low skill jobs that people want and need. And like, let's start first with agriculture, um, that they're, we already tried, and Michael's actually the expert on this, you know, we tried to shut down uh, temporary agricultural work uh, in 1965 with the ending of the Bracero program with the idea of, well, okay, Americans can do those jobs, but no American wanted to do those jobs at that pay. And if you went up to higher pay, then it wasn't necessarily profitable to continue planting. Or maybe it was profitable to plant, but only a certain set of crops. And so Michael's work on the Bracero program shows that there was a shift into mechanization rather than um, into uh, U.S. workers. And what ended up happening, and I remember this quite well being a kid in the late 70s, early 80s, is that there was a very limited set of vegetables available in the supermarket. You could only get vegetables that would, would be easily harvested by machine. So you had iceberg lettuce, you had a lot of frozen vegetables, you know, it was like peas and corn. And now there's a whole range of fresh fruits and vegetables. And a lot of that comes from the fact that we have low skilled immigrant entry. So I think that there's a market for those services and products. So the scenario I just outlined would give us the great avocado crisis of like exactly. 20, 26 or something. Exactly. It's also, and I would, I would add a, a second argument. It's not that easy for the federal government to determine who the best immigrants are. So if you look at the, the RAISE Act, which you, mm -hmm. which you mentioned, for example, that one, you can really tell that it was drafted by lawyers because the easiest way to get a lot of points is to be a lawyer. Uh, that's, it did really select on that, um, which is, is uh, remarkable. Anyway, we, we don't have a ton of time left, so I want to uh, go around the room for, for questions. So let's go over there first. Please hold, wait for, your, wait for Mike, and then please give us your Thank name. you very much. Yeah, so I, I found the book marvelous. I'm going to use it many times. I, I thought it was fantastic. But one of the things about it in the end, you talk about a grand bargain. So in this grand bargain, it could be very broad. One of your prior book, by the way, talked about how blacks were disadvantaged by immigration and gained when immigration was stopped, and they lost when immigrants came up from the South. And I presume it's still the same today. So in your grand bargain, would you have any provisions to offset the damage to African Americans from greater migration? And, well, that's the first start. Try that one. Hmm. Well, I think the main part of the grand bargain is legalizing immigrants who are already here. That's what has been at issue for, at least since 2013, there was uh, a, like we were holding out hope that um, the Senate and the House would um, pass a pathway to citizenship in exchange for um, more in intensive efforts on the border. And that did not pass in 2013, and that's the last that we've heard of an attempt at comprehensive immigration reform. And that's the bar grand bargain that we're talking about, is what to do about immigrants who are already here. Okay, so I think there is not there's, really... There's any... no compensation for Americans who are being going to be displaced by the incoming migrants, especially blacks. Well, I think when we're talking about immigrants who are already here, there's oh, not a, a lot of strong point. evidence no, You're that... talking about future immigration. You right, keeping immigration like at the current level, and there isn't really a lot of strong evidence that immigrants um, who are coming into the U.S. today are displacing U.S. workers, but including... But you say it in your book. You say uh, it in your book. You say, well, my previous book no, is... No, this book, too. This book. You say okay. in this book that migrants come here, they move to cities before mm -hmm. Americans, and that's part because they have different economic incentives. They start on a fresh table here, and Americans, on the other hand, have um, sunk costs, so to speak, in their communities... And so an immigration system, like with the OPTs, directly encourages 
it subsidizes foreign workers more than American workers. Now, that's a, are you going to address that fundamental feature of immigration policy in a grand bargain? Well, I don't think there's strong evidence that immigrants are um, taking jobs or lowering wages for U.S.-born workers, even lower-skilled U.S.-born workers, some of whom are black. Uh, but U.S.-born workers and immigrants do very different jobs, even if we're talking about people that we think of as high school dropouts. Because but, but, but this Sorry, is a that's not, let's not make this a, yeah, a debate. Yeah, so, but, Jimmy. But, no, no, I'm, so the guy, I'm the guy who's talking to you. Okay, but let's, let's not make so, this a debate. Let me, let me add, let me add one, one comment to what Leah is saying. I don't think the way we usually run things is that if there is a public policy change or some development in the economy that the federal government goes out and hands out checks to, to everyone who may or may not have, have lost out, right? That's, um, yeah, that's, I don't think that's how democratic capitalism typically works. Um, but I, I, under, I understand the, the impulse. It's obviously how, how other countries have organized themselves, especially until 1989. The, let's go. Can I say something? And also, what Leah was talking about um, legalizing undocumented migrants is going to reduce labor market competition for black workers because it's going to make it so that uh, they're not working under minimum wages. They, employers need to abide by regulations in the labor market. And so it's going to make it easier for black workers to improve their economic outcomes. So that's something that goes against your story. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation, Leah. Um, I wanted to ask you, being a migrant myself, um, when you were talking about natives, it was similar to your idea, Ana Maria. When are we natives? So my kid is not a native. Would my grandson be a native? And in that sense, is this evolving in time? Well, technically in the data, if you're US born, you're US born. And so you are a native. And so your kids would be and your grandkids would be. And I think that the point that Anna Maria was making was more of a research point uh, about how it might be useful to break out that group of the US born because they tend to come along in location with immigrants. They sort of co-locate. Uh, but yes, as um, technically, if you're born in the United States, you're an American. Yeah. Any other questions? Let's go over there, and then. I'm just going to ask a general question. You mentioned gender as a variable once. Is there any other circumstances in which gender is a relevant variable? That is a great question. And there is a reason why I haven't talked about it much. And that is because when we talked about constructing our data for the past and going to Ancestry.com and following people over time, how do we follow people? We use their names. We use their first name, their last name, and other features about them to try to find them multiple times, including finding them when they grow up, if they were living at home as a child of immigrants. The problem is, in the past, and even today, but especially in the past, women change their name at marriage, and so we lose them to this data. There are some graduate students at Princeton who are working at, on better ways so that we will be able to, to research the daughters of immigrants in the past. But at the moment, they're not in the book. And so because they're not, we do most of our comparisons between immigrant sons in the past and immigrant sons today. So we don't have much to say about women at all. The one thing we do have to say is because, of course, we're curious, we did uh, include some information about daughters today and came up with some really intriguing patterns. Uh, but we just felt quite constrained by our frame of trying to compare past and present. So it's a wonderful question. And hopefully, you know, I can come back in a couple years and tell you about how um, immigrant daughters past and present. Stan, if, if, if there's time, I'd love to come in, but only if there's time and I'll wait. Yes, let's, let's take one last question and then you can move. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is about um, um, correlation and causation, um, and it gets to a myth. Um, uh, what if immigration isn't really the significant variable because the myth is that immigrants are go-getters in some kind of uh, poorly defined way? If there were some way of measuring the go-getterness uh, 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 coefficient of a parent and then the success of the child, 
maybe immigrant status of the first generation is somehow a, a, a placeholder for something that's harder to measure. So when we first learned that the second generation, the kids of immigrants, were doing so well, we thought it has to be that immigrant parents value education, that they are more risk-taking, that they're more go-getters. And it's not to say that that's all wrong, but we found that there's a special feature about immigrants that matters the most in explaining why their kids are doing so well, which is that immigrants are footloose. Immigrants have already revealed to us by the fact that they've left home that they're willing to break family ties in order to chase economic opportunity. I am in awe of my co-author, Ron, whose English is not his first language, and he wrote this book with me, and he lives his life primarily in English. I'm in awe of Ana Maria um, and Sandra, my former student at UCLA who's here, um, who are immigrants and who are living in a different society. I could not do it. And so it's that footloose nature of, out, of immigrants that um, generates their success in the U.S. What do I mean? If we look at an immigrant family and a U.S.-born family living in the same county, actually, the, the kids of the immigrant family are doing no better. So why is it that immigrant, immigrants and their kids are doing so well? Because they're picking the places in the U.S. that provide the most upward mobility. And they're able to do that because they're not tied to family. They've come to the U.S. already and broken family ties. So this gave me a whole new way of thinking about what's special about immigrants. Not to say that they're not go-getters or they're not education-oriented, but they're especially, what is unique about immigrants is that they've moved. And moving is actually a very special thing about a person. Um, and so there's other elements to um, immigrant psychology and immigrant selection uh, that might be playing part of a role. And you know, we ourselves found that geography was just so powerful that we ended up stopping there. All right, let's go to Michael for some closing comments. Yes, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Yes, I, I just want to say a, a word about African Americans and women. The, 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 the idea that immigrants uh, hurt African Americans is, is even older than some of the myths that Leah discusses in her book. Uh, it, uh, an explicit justification for Chinese exclusion in the 1880s in, in Congress was that it would help African Americans during Reconstruction. Uh, Frederick Douglass was one of the people who uh, vociferously argued that that was uh, ludicrous. Uh, uh, David Reed, who co-authored the Johnson-Reed Act of, of 1924, explicitly uh, stated that it would help African Americans and uh, it even uh, justified African exclusion as something that would help African Americans, which is, uh, also doesn't pass the laugh test. And there's been uh, recent research in that regard uh, that claiming to show a relationship between immigration, low-skill immigration, and uh, uh, incarceration of black Americans that uh, a pair of researchers at uh, UC Berkeley uh, showed was due to uh, confounding from omitting uh, the crack ep epidemic of the 1980s. So that there, there really is a very, very uh, weak evidence base for this, and especially in the historical period that Leah is talking about. You know, uh, if, if one were to look at the situation of African Americans in the Jim Crow South of the 1910s and 1920s and 1930s and come to the conclusion that the real thing holding African Americans back was all the European immigrants. Uh, that, I, I just, I, I wouldn't know what to say about that other, other than that, that would not be, a, that would not be a, his, a, a serious analysis of what was going on in America at that time and what was uh, profoundly and, uh, and lastingly harming African Americans' uh, economic prospects. It's a it's a it's a canard that is often trotted out. Uh, Stephen Miller liked to refer to this uh, uh, a common, a supposedly common sense fact, but it, it's really not something that is uh, that is well supported by research literature about uh, about women. Uh, and this is where I'll, I'll close. You know, it, there there's a part in the book where uh, uh, it it notes uh, you know that there is in in talking about one of its uh, clearest policy recommendations which is not to place too much stress on high degrees of selectivity on edu education the book reads uh, quote there is strong demand for services that less educated educated immigrants provide today in construction the restaurant industry child and elder care agriculture etc uh, what i what i wished for more of was the next sentence of why is there so much demand for those services because those services are essential to economic growth and dynamism Silicon Valley does not just run on programmers. Silicon Valley, Valley runs on childcare and vegetable pickers and warehousers and security officers and so many other jobs that don't require even a high school degree. 
in many cases. And the, the one of the most fascinating papers in this whole literature that I know of is by uh, Patricio Cortes of uh, Boston University and Jose Tesala, who demonstrate that uh, low-skill immigration has caused uh, greater labor force participation by high-skill women in the United States. Uh, why? Because they make affordable elder care and child care more accessible. Uh, that's one of the ways that uh, indirectly immigration spurs dynamism, innovation, specialization, and the long-term growth of the economy that is just, uh, that is just terribly uh, captured by simple supply and demand models that are that, that, that stay in, in many of our heads from Economics 101 and, and this incredibly sophisticated book invites us to, to, to go beyond. Thank you, Michael. I think uh, unless uh, any of you have any closing comments or attack on each other, attacks on each other, I think we're, we're done here. Thank you all for coming. Thank uh, you so much. And have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs>